So what I've mentioned thus far really is intimacy as we move through the day with the moments, you know, being here for our breath or for the rain or when we're walking from place to place, feeling our bodies as we're moving, not living in a virtual reality. So intimacy with aliveness. And I mentioned the intimacy that can, can be when we, you know, or that we kind of block when we're with, e- when we're with each other. Now what I'd I'd like to mention is that our capacity to tolerate the pulls away from intimacy. So we have these pulls, our restlessness and our anxiety and busy mind and impatience. Our capacity to tolerate that and go, okay, come back, come back, and then show up in a relationship or show up during the day is very related to our relationship with our caregiver as an infant. So now we go into the realm of psychology. It's strongly affected by the infant caregiver bond, okay? So we're social creatures. We know that. We're at the core. And our brain development is directly impacted by the quality of attunement that we received. And attunement means the capacity of our caregiver to be present, to notice what's happening, and to respond with care. Does that sound familiar? Because these are the basic capacities of a meditative attention. If our caregiver had enough of that to notice when we were wet we needed to be changed or when when there was some kind of sense of of anxiety or fear, maybe what would be soothing and calming in a tone of voice, or when we needed to be held, or when we needed space. If there was some resonance, some sense of attunement like that, then we grow to have some trust in our belonging, that we matter, that there's some larger, some larger beingness that we're part of. If not, there's more of an acute sense of separation, more need to defend, and our tendency, instead of really going for intimacy with others, is to find substitutes. Because we don't think it's going to work out, rather we think it's going to hurt. Does that resonate for you? Yeah. So, if we don't have good attunement, there's a difficulty in trust. And the substitutes that we go for, we're familiar with. I've sometimes called them false refuges. False not meaning bad, just meaning they don't deliver intimacy really. So we'll go, the most obvious ones and the most early is food, something that soothes. Now it doesn't really give us a sense of connection and belonging, but it soothes temporarily, right? And then we go for certain kinds of relationships that are more dependent or relationships where we have power because power dependency gives us a taste of, of being involved but it doesn't really deliver. And we go for achievements. If we can prove ourselves worthy, then maybe we can find our way to intimacy. As we know, to the degree that our lives are organized around the substitutes, we are unable to cultivate the quality of presence that allows for intimacy. Story for you of a woman who was describing time with her father when he was dying and he had been a a larger than life figure for her and a well-known, highly respected architect and he designed buildings and urban centers and many praise pieces of work. And so they, they had had a really distant relationship for most of her life and uh, he was very work focused and um, that had caused her a lot of pain. She had to do a lot of inner work. And yet now at the end of his life they were spending quite a lot of time together. So she recounts asking him what of his accomplishments he felt most proud of. There was a long pause. And then he looked at her and he said, why you, of course. There were tears in his eyes. 
and I just am imagining that there was something about coming into reality and not regretting his creativity and his accomplishments but regretting the degree to which there was some, probably some striving and narrowing that stopped him from really relishing and savoring a loved one that was there. I mean, how many of us have we sensed, well, I'm at the end of my life looking back, what matters if we do that exercise? How many of us kind of sense our life and sense, well, what matters is that quality of intimate presence, not like I'm on my way somewhere else, but I'm here and here we are, and it's not like this is for the sake of something else, but we're here, and these connections matter. Open-heartedness, sincerity, realness. I think if we're at the end of our life looking back, Belonging is right at the center, knowing and living from our sense of belonging. So sometimes it takes, you know, that kind of end of life, jarring, wake up. But for most of us, I mean, you would not be here. You wouldn't be interested in a path of presence unless there was that yearning to bring that presence into life now, to find that intimacy now. So when we begin to sense, okay, so how do we cultivate it? Our practices here, mindfulness practices, are actually training in self-attunement. And I want to just emphasize that phrase again. Attunement is the critical piece in having us feel trust and belonging in our relationship with our caregiver. Well, what we're learning here is how to offer that same quality of present inwardly. And the healing and awakening that comes from that is what we might call the capacity to be intimate with life. So that's the frame I mean, for the remainder of time we have, that, that we are practicing this self-attunement. And what's really interesting to me, you know, because it's these two wings of, of the bird that we talk about often, we're learning how to notice what's here, how to understand and contact what is here going on right this moment inside me. You know, awareness of this breath, of these sounds, maybe awareness of loneliness, of sorrow. What's going on? That's one wing of the attunement. And the other wing is a quality of acceptance and tenderness that we hold that in, the two wings of the bird. Now, what's interesting to me, just in a more kind of on the science side, is that this training in mindful awareness, this training of these two wings, this inner attunement, actually affects the same part of, that is developed in the infant's brain with attunement. In other words, the frontal cortex and the limbic system are affected by self-attunement. Same parts of the brain. So, so let's, let's hone in a little more and look at how we bring these basic practices of self-attunement, of mindful attention, to the domains of our life. And the three domains I want to bring it to is a sensory present, because we start in these bodies. We can't be intimate with the world if we're not aware of sensations in our body. Now, what happens right now when I ask you are you awake inside your body? What you might notice is, well, maybe now I am, but I wasn't, <laughs> you know, right? Because generally when we're listening and thinking, what happens? We shut down our other senses. We're not hearing the sounds that are here, we're not feeling the sensations in our body, the emotions. So the first part of training intimacy is intimate with the aliveness, expressions of aliveness in this body. There's different ways of waking up the body and waking up the senses. Uh, what we practice here often is kind of scanning through the body 
And I find that if you just for a moment close your eyes and do a quick scan and you say, okay, I'm just going to do, instead of, you know, Tara's 10-minute scan, I'm just going to, you know, just do a quick scan from top down where you just feel the face, relax the face and just feel the sense, the softness around the eyes and, and then just feel the shoulders from the inside the arms and the hands, you start feeling sensation, waking up a little, chest open, soften the belly, and just feel the attention scanning down through the legs so that you're aware of the feet from the inside too, hands, the feet, and then widen it so you feel your whole body, this field of sensation, you're here. Now keep the attention within you for a moment. It can be very powerful to awaken all the senses as a very brief exercise of being intimate with the moment. You can feel the aliveness of the body. Now just listen to the aliveness of sound. Nothing to do. Sounds outside. listening into the space of the room. So you can feel sensations, including sound. You might sense light and darkness through the lids if your eyes are closed or if your eyes are open. Just take in image, form, color. So there's sensation, sound, light, dark. I wonder if you can sense smell. Just sense that you're taking in and receiving the space around you, the subtle fragrances and odors. So the senses are wide open, wide open. And you might sense with the senses wide open that your experience of who you are shifts that as we become intimate with our senses, with this living world, the self-story kind of falls away. There's a belonging to aliveness. Now you might listen to these words from Mary Oliver. This is a poem called White Flowers. Last night in the fields I lay down in the darkness to think about death, but instead I fell asleep as if in a vast and sloping room filled with those white flowers that open all summer, sticky and untidy in the warm fields. When I woke, the morning light was just slipping in front of the stars and I was covered with blossoms. I don't know how it happened. I don't know if my body went diving down under the sugary vines in some sleep-sharpened affinity with the depths, or whether that green energy rose like a wave and curled over me, claiming me in its husky arms. I pushed them away, but I didn't rise. Never in my life had I felt so plush or so slippery or so resplendently empty. Never in my life had I felt myself so near that porous line where my body was done with and the roots and the stems and the flowers began. Resplendently empty in that porous line where we sense our belonging. So this is the first realm that we begin to explore, that we sense this aliveness that's right here and an intimacy with that and a certain wisdom that arises that when we really open our senses we realize we're not who we thought we were we're not inside that small, confining story anymore. Resplendently empty. 
and belonging to aliveness. Now, the second domain of intimacy is what I sometimes call intimacy with the animal-headed goddesses, which are all the emotional realm. And um, in Asian art and in the temples of Asia, you also see it in the mandalas, that to enter sacred space, to get to the center of the mandala, to the center of the temple, to that space of, of freedom and peace, you have to go through these animal-headed goddesses, these deities that are wrathful and passionate and fearsome and you know, scary-looking creatures. If you look at the cover of Tricycle magazine uh, right now, it's got one of those kind of deities, the wrathful deities. It's an issue that talks a lot about anger, which is good. And, and the basic teaching is, to get to sacred space, the deities are part of the trip. These emotions, this aliveness that we call, you know, sometimes we call the inner weather systems, that can, we sometimes wish weren't there, the fear and the anger and the jealousy and the sorrows, these are actually the energies that transform and awaken through us. So, to get to sacred space, we have to be with the deities. We have to bring presence to emotions. And so that's something that we have explored here a lot. I mean, it's something that um, I, I talk about a lot in terms of RAIN, using that acronym to help unpack these emotions so that we can bring the two wings of seeing what's going on. Okay, seeing the fear. Okay, fear, fear. Sensing how it's playing in my body. What are the beliefs that are going with it? How does it really affect me when the fear, when I'm the, getting that felt sense fully? Can I bring kindness? Can there be a sense of tenderness? And in the moments that we bring an intimate attention to fear, it no longer possesses us. In those moments, we become that presence that's larger than fear. We're like that ocean that can include the waves. We're no longer suffering. Being with the deities story from, for, uh, from Naomi Rachel Remen, who's a, a physician and healer and teacher and writer who I deeply respect. And she uses art and meditation and presence, a healing presence in working with uh, people that are going through cancer and, and, and major illness. And one of the stories she describes, a young man who was 25 and he had to have uh, one of his legs amputated at the hip in order to save his life from bone cancer. So she describes that when she began with him, he was just filled with kind of grief and rage and they were so great. It took several years of this healing presence, of working through, drawing pictures and feeling and being with and, and being in dialogue with and the whole thing because um, he had to heal not just his body but his spirit. You know. So he worked hard and he did that healing and developed quite a compassion for others that were dealing with the deities that come up when there's great loss, the fear, the anger, the sense of oppressiveness. So I'll read you what... what he, he began to visit people in the hospital who had also suffered severe physical losses. On one occasion he visited a young singer who was so depressed about the loss of her breast that she would not even look at him. The nurses had the radio playing, probably hoping to cheer her up. It was a hot day and the young man had come in running shorts. Finally, desperate to get her attention, he unstrapped his artificial leg and began dancing around the room on one leg, snapping his fingers to the music. She looked at him in amazement and then she burst out laughing and said, Man, if you can dance, I can sing. <laughs> now, when this young man first began working with drawing, he, be, he made a crayon sketch of his own body in the form of a vase with a deep black crack running through it. He redrew the crack over and over, grinding his teeth with rage. Several years later, to encourage him to complete his process, uh, the therapist showed him his early pictures again. He saw the vase and said, Oh, this one isn't finished. And when she suggested he finish it, he did. He ran his finger along the crack saying, You see here, this is where the light comes through. 
with a yellow crayon, he drew light streaming through the crack into the body of the vase and said, our hearts can grow strong at the broken places. So this is key in understanding a path to intimacy, that the very wounds and hurts and pain we feel that makes us want to run away is exactly the place if we're willing, if we have the courage to pay attention and often we need support in doing it that's exactly the place where our heart most wakes up becomes luminous and tender and as wide as the world those are the portals in fact every emotion has an intelligence that if we pay attention to it it transforms and our sense of our own being enlarges and that energy is released to really be a creative part of our life. Intimacy with the deities, okay? So that's, that's the, the next one that I, I really want to mention because there's a wisdom that comes from it. When we're suffering from emotions, when we're at, in battle with them, when we're turned on ourselves because of our emotional life, when we're contracted, in those moments they have our identity. We are identified. I am the fearful person. I am victimized by fear. I'm using fear as an example. When we bring the two wings of attention, when we become intimate with fear, there's a shift in identity. There is a wisdom that wakes up that gets it that that story of a self oppressed by fear was just a story and that what we are can't be defined. It's that edgeless ocean that it's a compassionate presence that's with the fear but we're not a fearful self. That's where the freedom is. Okay, so I've spoken to a bit of intimacy with this living world, these senses, intimacy with the emotions, the last piece, as you might imagine, is intimacy with others. And it may be that I have to continue this in another talk, I'll, I'm going to keep track of time tonight. But what we know is that to be intimate with others, it's like widening circles. We have to be able to be intimate with the aliveness of our body and the moods of our heart. That's the ground level. That self-attunement wakes up the part of the brain that is capable of empathy, compassion, presence with others. It just does. So we begin to learn to pay attention to each other without controlling. Because a meditative presence, a mindful presence, is not controlling what it's aware of. It's simply aware without judgment just noticing. So we begin to pay attention to each other like that, where we're interested and we care, but we're not there with an agenda. And so that's the training, is this attuned, undefended presence with each other. And, and I think of it, and you can just think of it as listening and speaking, what happens in those realms, because so much of our world with each other is in communication. How is it that we um, pay attention when we're listening. What if you chose one person that in one situation that you knew you're just going to practice, like I mentioned with my son, okay, this conversation, I'm going to see if I can keep letting go of the controlling and just be there. And in that being there, there's a natural interest. Sometimes I have to say to myself, I have all the time in the world because there's so much of this uh, tightening by the sense of we don't have much time. So that kind of open-endedness, just here with each other. Again, the training means you have to kind of pick, you can't say, okay, I'm going to always listen in this open-ended way to everybody from now on. It won't work. <laughs> it just won't. Pick somewhere, pick someone and then see what happens if there's no agenda and see if you can offer undivided attention. Now they're speaking too. This is Adrienne Roth, she says, 
an honorable human relationship that is one in which two people have the right to use the word love is a process of deepening the truths they can tell each other. It is important to do this because it breaks down human self-delusion and isolation. So we listen in that way without an agenda and we speak not to get approval, not to influence, not to impress, but rather the truths that are difficult. And again, it's not with everybody in every conversation, but what if you picked somewhere where you're going to play that edge of going to a deeper level of realness? This is what nourishes intimacy. So we're talking about that kind of presence and silence, grounded in the senses, open to emotion, that uh, the natural response is care. And we practice that with loved ones, with someone we know. But there's another level I want to speak to also, which is, you know, Einstein sometimes describes it, that, has described it that we limit our love to just a small circle of people. So what does it mean to really um, nourish intimacy and intimate attention and openness with a lot of people? And I'd like to share a a story I ran into some years ago that that touched me on this, this front. The person writes, During my second month of nursing school, our professor gave us a pop quiz. I was a conscientious student and breezed through the questions until I read the last one. What is the first name of the woman who is here every day cleaning the school, the custodian? Surely this was some kind of joke. I'd seen, I'd seen her you know, regularly. She's tall, dark-haired, in her fifties, but how would I know her name? I handed in the paper, leaving the last question blank. Another student asked, will the last question count towards the grade? Absolutely, said the instructor. In your careers you will meet many people. All are significant. They deserve your attention and care, even if all you do is smile and say hello. I've never forgotten that lesson. I also learned her name was Dorothy. What if we each chose one person that we see regularly, but we don't pay close attention to or we don't really put out. Just one person and explored what happened, and this is part of the metta or loving-kindness training. If we just brought more attention, if we wondered, well, what brings happiness to this person? Or what does this person need? How might this person be suffering? And just offered our smile, a few words. It enlarges who we are. Our self-sense is really just this person, just operating in this way. We become larger. Our heart opens more. Admit something, writes Hafiz. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you do not do this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. Still, though, think about this. This great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying, with that sweet moon language, what every other eye in this world is dying to hear? So, we live in this world with so many ways that we separate, so many ideas of who's part of us and who's them, to really move through and it becomes an adventure that there isn't anyone exempt, anyone that we have to exclude from our heart. Rather, it is possible just to have that openness, that tenderness that responds in the moment. It doesn't take so much time, it just takes a little more attention. So our training to be intimate with all things is a life training. Because we're talking about being intimate with people and intimate with our inner life and intimate with nature, 
intimate with the sound of the thunder and intimate with the sound of the rain and the smells and this is a training that takes a lifetime and it's an adventure you know, it's, there's not an activity or a person or a moment that it's not possible to wake up our heart if that's our intention so we'll do a final kind of closing meditation if you will just let yourself come into a, a nice posture and a stillness just to feel the intention to be intimate with just these moments you don't have to do a for the rest of my life kind of thing but just that sincerity of starting fresh in this moment really fresh because it's a mystery when we start fresh opening your senses so that you can feel the aliveness in your body can help just to even feel the hands on the inside and the feet. And just let the awareness spread. Relaxed, awake in the body, aware of the sounds that are here. And relax your heart open so you can just sense what's in your heart right now an intimate presence with your own heart. If the heart's troubled, that intimate presence can be an active offering of kindness. Sometimes I just say, it's okay, sweetheart. It's kind of amazing that just those words or just that simple gesture of gently touching your own heart brings an intimacy, an intimate presence with the life that's here. What if through the day we pause just for this, we've just been 30 seconds or so, feel the body, let the senses be awake, listen to our hearts, offer some kindness, and then sense how much this world lives in our hearts. You can sense the space you're in and the beings that are here, that are really part of your heart. And family and friends. And the other creatures on this earth that we sometimes don't think of that really belong to us because we're part of the earth together. The elephants, the bees, the creatures that run, the creatures that swim, the creatures that fly that you can feel you're holding the earth or mother in your lap all of the world in your heart intimate with life closing with a short poem sun drapes a buttered scarf across your shoulder Rose opens herself to your glance. Rain shares its divine melancholy. The whole world keeps nibbling your ear like a neglected lover. Sensing this world, this aliveness you belong to. Sensing this vast awareness that's right here. Awake and tender and open. Our shared belonging, that oneness, that one presence. That there's really only one here. offering our collective prayer that all beings everywhere might discover the beauty and blessings of living intimately with this life, of embracing the life within, 
life everywhere. In that intimacy, discovering the peace and the love that is our potential, may all beings everywhere awaken and be free. Namaste.